Hey, do me a favor. Uh, if you guys would participate a little bit with me, uh, would you guys mind if all the people in the room uh, who are single, could you raise your hand just loud and proud? Are you single? Raise your hand. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your bravery. Okay, now let's get, let's, I want to get another hand raised. Uh, raise your hand in here if you at some point in your life want to be married. Raise your hand if at some point in your life, married people, you can go ahead and put your hands up. You already did it. All right. So, okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. Now, raise your hand if when you saw the single people raising their hands, you saw someone kind of cute. And raise your hand if tonight may be the night you get those digits. All right. So that's a great way to find some, uh, some you know, relationships if you just hang around young adult ministries enough. You, uh, we go through enough single and marriage and dating series that you can be like, what, you like? Okay, awesome. So uh, listen, when we go to Chick-fil-A tonight, could be, could be magical, all right? Could be a magical time. Well, hey, if I, had to, if I had to quantify it, if I had to just guess all of the people who I've ever met in my life, I would, I would guess that 99% of the people who I've ever met have a desire to one day be married. And just based on like the hands in this room, that's pretty, I can't see all of you guys, but uh, a, a lot of, I could see there's a lot of movement. Um, and what that means is you probably re resonate with that. At some point in your life, there would be a time where you hope to one day be married. And the desire to be married is a great thing. The desire to be single is a great thing. I think sometimes we elevate the, this, this status of marriage kind of to lord over single people, and that's like never the case. You know, if you think about it, every time you pray, you're praying to a single adult. Um, that's, uh, that's Jesus, by the way. He never got married, never dated. Um, but listen, but I don't think there's anything wrong with this desire to be married. And for some reason, this desire to be married is just a lot of people have it. Most people have this desire to be married. And do you know that God wants you to have amazing dating relationships? God wants you to have amazing marriage relationships. He wants you to be able to interact with the people in your life romantically in a way that is just such a blessing to you and honors him and honors everybody. God wants this for you in an amazing, amazing way. And you know, every time I preach a sermon um, and, and here on a Sunday morning, my, my goal is not to entertain people for 35 minutes. My goal is to not just come up and think that you... Hopefully you guys will be like, that was, that was a nice talk. You know, my goal every time that I come and I like try to preach out of the Bible is for you to not just like hear it and enjoy it and be gone, uh, but I want you so badly. My prayer and my hope is that for every time we, we talk about the Bible, you would actually ask God, God, could you actually take this truth and could you transform me? Could you change me? Could you make me more into who you want me to become? And nothing, there is, this, is, this type of series, a series on, on relationships and dating, this is one of those times where like, I'm just so praying that this group of people, that you guys would get the way God would want you to date. Because if you get it, if you understand the, like the plan that God has for dating and marriage, you actually could be blessed like exponentially. You could avoid so much unnecessary hardship that the rest of the normal world goes through because they date the way they want to date. And God is very specific on, on relationships. And it's, it's one of those things where it, relationships and who you decide to date, and who you decide to marry, they're such an important thing. They affect so much about you in your life. And, you know, outside of if the decision to follow Jesus or not, the person that you marry is the most important decision you will ever make. And what's kind of cool is that in this, this weekend, a couple days ago or yesterday, we actually had two people who decided that they wanted to get married. We had Max and Megan who just got engaged. Can we give it up for Max and Megan? Listen, that's awesome. We're, we're, I, you, know what, you know what my hope is? My hope is that every single person in here will get to experience uh, what, it is, what it's like to be a part of a dating relationship that honors God and, that, that, and be, one day be a part of a marriage that, that honors God and blesses people. But th listen, this is one of those things that it's like so crucial that we get this right because this impacts every part of you. Who you decide to saddle up with 
and get married to, this will impact your life. It'll impact your future family. It'll impact your future kids. It'll impact your financial, financial situation. It'll imp- impact what you like to do and what you don't like to do, what you, what you, just all the different things in your life. You, who you decide to marry will impact. And so this idea of dating is interesting. And interestingly enough, do you know that the Bible does not actually speak to dating? Do you guys know this? It's because dating is, is a relatively modern invention. It's, da- you know, it's, it's been around for 100 years or so. So the Bible doesn't actually speak to that. But what the Bible does speak a lot to is marriage and romance and sex and relationships and decision making. And so what we, can, what we can glean from what the Bible has to say about all these topics that, that kind of encompass dating is we can actually infer a couple things about what the Bible would actually say about dating. And tonight as we begin this series, I want us to look at just like what's the purpose of dating? Why do you date? Like maybe that's something you've never really asked yourself. You just kind of always have dated. But have you ever thought about what is the purpose of dating? What's the end result? And for most of us, like we talked about at the front, most of us in this room one day want to be married. Most of us have this desire to do this. And so I think when it's so good to start with the end in mind when you're working through something like this. It's like if you were to uh, work on this huge, giant jigsaw puzzle without ever looking at the picture. One, the thing that would be great is if you could see the big picture, if you could see the end result. That way you can kind of work backwards and see what's going on. And the same is true with our dating relationships. If you want to date in a way that blesses people, that blesses you and honors God, then let's look at the end result of what we're hoping to eventually accomplish, which is marriage. So tonight we're going to look at one passage and then we're going to talk about three implications from this one passage on our dating. And so we're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 2. And here we see that God had just finished creating uh, the world and everything in it. And on the sixth day, he creates human beings. He creates man. And God, he gives Adam a task and he gives him a job. And he gets to start to name all the animals. And, but, he, but God knew that creation was incomplete. Creation was incomplete. And we, and we see this in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25 says this, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Which, if we can just like pause for a second there, like imagine this, God created the world. He created man. He gave man purpose and a job and he's, he's working. He's in like the perfect environment ever. He has perfect relationship with God, yet something was missing. Something was missing. And God said, I'm going I'm to give him someone that is, that is like, like him, that could be a helper to him, that is someone who he could be with. And so it says this in verse 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. All the names of the animals that we have, your father Adam did that. And, it's, and, he, and that was his name. Then the man gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. I imagine, because one of the instructions that God gave uh, the the creatures of the world is, hey, be fruitful and multiply. And I imagine Adam, as he's going through and he's meeting all the aardvarks, and he sees there's like a, there's a, a girl aardvark and a boy aardvark. And he's, you know, sees the dogs and there's a girl dog and a boy dog. And they're like all having a good time. They're all having a good, you know, it's fun. Uh, but Adam, I'm sure with every interaction, was just like, man, I don't have like what they have. That's crazy. These animals, like I don't have anyone that's like that for me. You know, I don't have this relationship that I see, I mean, even these animals having. I can't imagine. And I imagine there's like this longing in Adam and you get to see kind of, this to be true in his life. There was some, there were, he was missing something. And so what did God do? In verse 22, in verse 21, it says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to call, to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he closed up its place with flesh. 
And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. This is like the first divine surgery that's ever taken place, everybody. God puts Adam asleep and he, and he surgically somehow, he's got, he can do whatever he wants. You know, he, he takes a rib out and he uses this rib and he, and he crafts this woman. You know, I, when I, um, this December, I'll have been married five years, which is pretty cool. And um, the, I remember on our wedding night, or our wedding day, when we, we kind of had that first look, you know, we, we took pictures beforehand, which is what everybody needs to do, by the way. Don't let, you don't make your people wait in the reception, take your pictures beforehand. Um, don't do that. Okay, never mind. She just got married. Anyway, do whatever you want. Um, but I remember one of, the, one of the things that we did was I got to do like the first look with, with Kyla before the actual ceremony. And like I, you know, we did like the classic thing where I, she, I was turned around, she came in, she tapped on my shoulder. And man, the first time I saw Kyla in that wedding dress, it was just like, like it took my breath away. It was amazing. And this is what God was essentially doing with Adam. He, he, he took something from Adam, he crafted this woman, and then he it says he brought the woman to her, or to him. And then th this, is, this is, again, right what I'm about to read is awesome. Guys, if you are taking notes about how to uh, um, win over a lady, you should maybe do this. Maybe not. It might be weird, but it would be cool. Then the man said, this at last. He start, in other translations, it's like this, finally, this is, this is the person I've been waiting for. Every, like all the beasts of the field, the birds of the, like they, they all had their stuff, but this one is like me. This, the, oh man, and then what he does, this is poetry. He writes poetry. This is the first example of poetry in the history of the human world. It says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That sounds creepy, but it was probably cool. It probably worked, you know? And he said, she shall be called woman. He was naming everything. And so he sees her and said, She's, she will be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then Moses, who's writing this, who's writing, who, Moses wrote the, wrote the first five books of the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Then Moses kind of jumps out of the, the, the narrative and does commentary right here. And this is what he says. He says, because of all this, all the stuff that we see just happened, therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. It, this we see right here is the first marriage. The marriage between Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. And this is the union that God created. He created the people to be a part of the union. He created the union to encompass the people. And this is what we know. If God created marriage, then this is the example that, that he said. It's, it's a marriage that, he, that is a God-ordained marriage is, is between one man, one woman, one lifetime, a committed covenant relationships. Do you know that marriages are not contracts? A contract is you do this for me, I do this for you. Marriage is not like that. It is a covenant relationship of like, I'm entering into this because I love you. It's a covenant relationship with two individual parties where the two become one, both physically and spiritually. Like marriage is this beautiful, beautiful picture. This, it's the foundational institution by which all the other institutions came from. Like, like do you notice that God didn't first make a parental institution the first thing that happened. It was marriage. Marriage was the first thing. And this was, marriage was God's idea. And marriage, it's, it's probably better than you think. Marriage, uh, this, I heard a great definition of, of marriage. Marriage, it meets our needs for companionship and provides a picture of our relationship with God. You know, after... The Apostle Paul, who is another single guy, the Apostle Paul actually referenced this verse where it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, shall hold fast to his wife, they shall become one flesh. 
the Apostle Paul was writing in, to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, and he was quoting this passage. He was talking about marriage. And listen to what he said about marriage. He said that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, he says, this mystery is great. Do you know every time that the, the writers of Scripture says there's, there's a mystery, what that simply means, it's not like this uh, whodunit thing. The, a mis- this mystery that he's referring to is that there is something that has been true since the beginning of time that we just did not know yet. And then when, anytime they write about a mystery, that means that God has just kind of revealed supernaturally to the writers of scriptures. And now they know something that God has always intended. And this is what God has always intended about marriage. This is what he says in Ephesians 5.32. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church, this, the man should leave his father and mother, should hold fast to his wife, and they should become one flesh. That is a picture of Christ in the church. And just as the church is subject to Christ as its head, like what, we, what we're doing as we gather together, we are the church. We are a part of this local body of believers. Collectively, we are the church. And our head, the person who, is, who we, we submit to is Jesus. He is the person. And then just like the church is to be subjected to Christ, um, you know, the wife is to be subjected to her husband. And just as the Christ loves the church, so the husband should love their wives and to sacrifice for their wives. Like this picture, marriage is bigger and better than what you think. Like it's not only this incredible covenant that gets to express this desire that you have for companionship and love and intimacy. It's also a picture of, of a greater truth about who God is in our creator. It's this holy union. And God's original design of marriage is amazing, and it's to be held with reverence and honor. So in light of this, in light of Genesis 2, in light of what what we read about what marriage is according to God, then how should you date? How should you date? How should a person who who follows Jesus in 2022, how should they go about dating people? Knowing that everything, this is created by God. This is for God. This is a picture of God. This is for your good. And how how should you do it? And tonight, I just want to close with three implications that we get from these passages about dating. If this is true that God created it, that he has a special design for it, then it should change the way you date. And I'm just going to talk to you right now. I'm just going to talk to followers of Jesus. So if you're in here and you you wouldn't identify as a follower of Jesus, we're so glad you're here. But listen, I'm right now, I'm talking to people who love Jesus and who follow Jesus. And ultimately, I think it's a better plan for everybody. So even if you're not a Christian, you probably should date like this because it's going to go well for you. And so, but this is, I'm talking to people who claim that they want to follow Jesus. There are three things, three implications about dating that I think we get from how God created the institution. And number one, a follower of Jesus understands the importance of who you choose to date. It's important. You know, we, last, last series we talked about friends and future. We know that your friends actually dictate your future. Your friends are like elevator buttons. They'll bring, either take you up or they'll take you down. And the same is true even to a greater extent with the person that you choose to date. It'll dictate where you go. You know, I've had friends who uh, were were strong Christians, who loved Jesus, followed Jesus, went to church, went to youth group, you know, all that stuff. And they started, uh, some of them started dating people who were either apathetic in their faith or claimed that they loved Jesus but really didn't or just like outright didn't follow Jesus at all. And every single time, that person, while they were dating that person, started to like fall away from God. It just wasn't important for them anymore. And the people, the person, my friend who, who, who married one of these people, that person's not a Christian anymore. Do you know that it's so important who you date? The people that you allow yourself to date matters. This is not just like one of those like flippant things where I think he's cute, you know, like, oh my gosh, we both love Monopoly. We're in love. Like, this is, like, this is not one of, 
you should have, it should matter who you allow yourself to date. It's a big, big deal. And listen, you may think that you're going to be the one person. Be like, listen, he's awesome. He's like, he does, he's not a Christian at all, but I think I can get him. I think I can get him. You're not going to be the person to missionary date and do it well. All right. You're not going to be able to flirt to convert. This is not one of the, it's just not going to go well for you. All right. You know, King Solomon, King Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. King Solomon, the son of David, one of the amazing men of the, of the Hebrew people. Like, like, oh man, he was na- named a uh, man after God's own heart. This is who David was. And his son Solomon reigned. He had like, he was the most wealthy person who ever lived. He was the most intelligent person who ever lived because at, God like supernaturally gave him like supreme wisdom. Do you know what's happened to Solomon? Solomon... He started to veer off track with his dating and marriage relationships. I think you could it's safe to say. Solomon ended up with several hundred wives and concubines. That's, that's veering off a little bit. That's not approved in scripture, by the way. He was disobeying the Lord. And hear, hear this, the man who, whose dad was King David, the man who God implanted like supernatural wisdom in his life, he married somebody who was a pagan. He married idol worshipers. And this man, who had seen God move, started to worship idols. He started to turn away from God. Listen, I, I, I mean, I don't want to be presumptuous. I don't think you're the wisest person who's ever lived in this room. I'm certainly not. And if it can get him, it can get me. It matters who you date. It matters so much. And so when, you know, we're going to, throughout the series, we're going to talk specifically and dive into different things that we should look for and and attributes that we should create in our own lives to date in a way that honors God and blesses people and creates a great foundation for the rest of your life and relationships. Uh, So this is more of kind of an overview, big picture sermon, but a few things that I think as we talk about the idea of who should you date, I have like four quick things. You should actually date somebody, you should only date somebody who authentically follows Jesus. Listen, if you're on the dating apps and you see that someone marks Christian, you and I know very well that does not mean that they probably are Christian. You have to do some more digging, am I right? You got to figure out like, okay, let's, what are their picture? What are they holding? What are they, um, you know, you have to figure out what, ex- you have to, it's not good enough to be like, oh, you're Christian? Good. We're good. We're good. We don't even talk about it anymore. We just need to get to know each other. No, you need to find someone who authentically follows Jesus. And I I, I read this amazing statistic uh, this week. And it said that about four in 10 Americans who have been married since 2010, so essentially 40% of people who have been married since 2010, have a spouse who is in a different religious group than them. So about four out of 10 uh, Americans have a spouse who doesn't believe what they believe. Um, But when it comes to politics, a 2016 Pew Research survey found that 77% of both Republicans and Democrats were married to or living with a partner who said that their spouse or partner was in the exact same party. So what this tells me is that in America, it is more of a deal breaker that you're in a different political party than what you believe about eternity. And listen, you may feel that way. And you may think, man, I just, Thanksgiving's will be difficult if we married this type of person. So I'm not going to, that's just off the table. But I'll be, I'm open to different thoughts about, you know, God and spirituality. Listen, this, we've got to be people who, who actually look at people who authentically follow Jesus as kind of the base level of who we choose Today, another thing that you should do, you should try to find, this is just like practical, personal opinion now. You should try to find someone who like shares the same values as as you. If you have like a particular affinity and love for a particular thing or whatever, um, or just, you know, you need to find somebody who kind of shares that or can empathize with you on that. You know, that's probably a good thing to do. To get really practical, you should date somebody you're attracted to. Can I get an amen? There you go. Listen, don't, the, dating leads, you know, hopefully leads to marriage. You're going to be looking at this person quite a lot, you know? Find someone who you don't mind looking at. But listen, all, don't stop there. Actually find somebody 
who you can have fun with. Again, this is just like my, this is not like in the Bible. This is like my personal opinion. Because listen, looks are going to fade, but personality stays. You're going to be with this person until you die. Make sure it's someone that you can get along with, you can have fun with. This is just a little detour of what I think. But listen, this is a, this is a big, you know, the people you date, you ready for this? They become the pool in which you marry. It's insane. It's supposed to be funny. It didn't really work out. <laughs> I'll do it again. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, so you got to do that. Number two, a follower of Jesus understands the importance of how you choose to date. So if marriage is God's idea, and if dating is an avenue for marriage, then we have to figure out how we should date. We have to, we have to figure this out. If it's, if it's one woman, one lifetime, one flesh, one, one, uh, one committed covenant relationship, it should look different than how the rest of the world dates. Am I right? Because you should lead, as a follower of Christ, you should lead any dating relationship that you have with love and reverence for that person, even if you don't end up marrying that person because the person that you are currently dating is a, or that you will date in the future has the image of God on them. They have the imago Dei. That means that you're different than all the other created beings. You have the image of God implanted on you, which means you have intrinsic value and intrinsic worth. That means you are a child of God. You are a son of God, a daughter of God. And that means that you are dating the child of God. Even if it doesn't work out, you are dating somebody who God loves and sacrificed for and believes in. And it should look different than how everybody else treats how they date somebody. And I, I, I firmly am a, a big believer in an, an attempt to um, be different than how everybody else dates in this world. What you need to do is to be, if you, wanna, if you wanna follow God and you wanna serve God, you need to just set up intentional guardrails in your life so that you can honor God and honor that person that you're dating. And a, a guardrail is simply a barrier that is inward from the actual, uh, off, like falling off the cliff, that if you hit this guardrail, you know, it's, it stinks, it's annoying, it might mess up your car a little bit, but it actually protects you from going off the cliff. And a guardrail may be for you that, you know, guardrails are different for everybody. But maybe for you, you need to set up some emotional guardrails in your life. Maybe uh, you, you come in hot with like everything that you expect out of a, out of a marriage in a, in a dating relationship up front. And then you, it gets really, you know, they, they start a lot of talks and a lot of promises. And then all of a sudden, maybe that doesn't work out. And you're left like carrying like, but he said he loved me. But we were going to have like, we we're going to have three kids. We were going to, we were going to like live this perfect life together. Maybe something that you should do is to maybe just like hold off talking some of this really serious stuff in your dating relationship till you're ready. Because you need to guard yourself emotionally. You need to make sure that you are not somebody who's putting way too much pressure on that other person. You, you, it might be some good ideas to create some emotional guardrails. And, and this, is the, this next one's probably the biggest one. I would, I would implore you guys to consider putting some sexual guardrails up. Because can I tell you a secret? It's really hard not to have sex with someone that you're dating, that you think is attractive, and that you think is really fun. It's really hard. And what the world has done is they, they've taken sex out of marriage and they said, this is awesome. You can do it whatever you want. It's like, what, however you want to do it, you can do it. And it is fine. But how many of you know Every time that you take sex out of the context that it was supposed to be in and you, you use it in a way that you want to use it rather than God wants to use it, how many of you guys have felt the pain of using something out of its place? We have, we're in a society now who are revolting against the people who are taking sex out of its responsible, good, and holy place. But we're still championing it like it's not a big deal. It's whatever you want, as long as it's consensual, it's fine. And what the Bible has to say, it's, it, it's within the covenant of marriage. It's so important. It's so great. It's so good. He created it for your good and your enjoyment. But he, he wants you to do it in this proper place. 
And so maybe for you, you need to like try to be intentional about how you set up your guardrails to protect yourself from falling off the cliff, protect your, 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 your girlfriend or boyfriend from falling off the cliff. And maybe, maybe for you, your guardrail is like, hey, I just can't be in your apartment alone together. Like if, I, if I'm there, can your roommate be there? Like, or maybe like, hey, we just, can't, we just can't keep watching like Netflix after midnight until like four in the morning. We just can't do that. Like it leads to stuff. I, like you need to figure out what is that for you? Like what are some guardrails for you that you need to set up in order to protect you and the child of God that you're dating? Or maybe like what's, if you're not dating anyone right now, this is the perfect time to establish what you hope to your future relationship to be and be like, you know, I'm going to make the commitment. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to do things God, God's way and, and date the way God wants me to date. And I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm doing everything I can to, to not fall off the cliff. And so I'm just like right now, I'm going to purpose in my heart that I'm, I'm just not going to be alone at their house by, them, by, by ourselves. We're just not going to do it. And listen, is there anything wrong of being like by someone's, by yourself at an apartment or whatever? There's nothing wrong with that, but we need to use wisdom to figure out what that leads to at times. And maybe your guardrail is different than other people's guardrail. We know what, what we shouldn't do, but we need to be people who are, who are wise, who actually want to date the way God wants us to date and how he wants us to date. And you know, if God created marriage the way he did, and if you are trying to follow him, you should date differently than everybody else. And listen, what will happen if you decide to date like this and you set up guardrails, the person that you may be dating or your friends may be like, oh, that's so weird. That's so annoying. It's supposed to be annoying. It's supposed to be like, gosh, this is a buzzkill. This is the worst. But listen, can I, can I tell you something? You, the, in the, maybe in like the past relationships of your life, when you've experienced pain, I can guarantee you that it probably did not come from trying to do things God's way. I would imagine the pain in your life happened when people started to do things that, like the way everybody else does things. And what if we were different? What if we dated different? What if you dated different? What if you dated in a way that, that honored God, that honored the institution that he has set up? Number two, we gotta be people who understand the importance of how you date. And number three, the last one, we need to date with marriage in mind. We need to date with marriage in mind. Have you ever talked to somebody and they're just like, how you doing? They're like, I'm good, I'm doing good. I'm just doing me right now. I'm just dating for fun. You know, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to have a lot of fun. You know, nothing serious, just trying to, just trying to do me. You know, I'm just having a good time. Um, you know, again, if, if marriage is what God has created it to be, then it matters who you date. It matters how you date. And this idea of dating just for dating's sake is not really anything productive. Like dating should be fun. Like you should be having a good time with dating. Then you're not dating the right person if you're not having a fun time. Um, I can say that. But listen, if you, the, the culture that we live in, like casual dating and dating just for dating's sake and just to have fun, often leaves uh, people being let on. Casual dating, just not dating for, for, for marriage, it can lead to a lot of like casual sexual encounters that end up hurting you in the long run. And like this idea of like casual dating and just like, I, I don't really, I'm not really looking for anything serious. Like it's kind of like this me-centric idea where you look at the purpose of, if the purpose of dating is to, to find someone to marry and the purpose of marriage is to enjoy this companionship and to be a picture of God and to enjoy covenant relationship, then that's like not really what this is for. It's like in a different category. And if you want to date in a way that honors God and honors the institution, institution of marriage, then you need to date with marriage in mind. Can I, can I real quick tell you what this is not? Um... This is not, uh, you, don't be a psycho about this, everybody, okay, guys? Like, don't, don't on a first date just be like, I want to be married to you. Like, I just want to just figure out if this could, be, if it could work. I, how many kids do you want? Four? Awesome. Awesome. That's what I want, too. Like, it's would be great. Uh, what kind of, where do you want to live? What kind of house? Okay. Listen, that's not what I mean by dating with marriage in mind. What I mean, again, don't be a psycho, guys. Don't, someone's going to see this and be like, 
I'm gonna, a girl's going to come to me and be like, listen, this guy came to me and he's freaking me out. I'm like, it's not what I meant. Um, if, you wanna, if you're on a date with a girl, guys, and you start doing that, that's a good way to get them to text their friend to tell them to call um, you, them to get out of this date. That's a good way to make that happen. But listen, you should, you should, as you're dating, you should look and you are always trying to evaluate, is this the type of person who I want to spend the rest of my life with? You don't have to say that. But you, everything you're evaluating, like you should look at the way that they handle hardship. You should be looking for that. You should be looking for, like, okay, with this person, do, do, they, do they treat me well? Do they treat their family well? A lot of people date on potential, and that's the worst idea ever. You should date on past performances. And you, as a, as a person who is looking to date with marriage in mind, you need to be always trying to find, like, you're just always evaluating. You're not, you're not somebody who's always uh, just filled with, with critical spirit, but you are being critical. You're trying to, this dating is a very critical time. You're, you're learning and trying to figure out if this is the person that you want to be tied to for the rest of your life. Will this person be a good dad? Will this person be a good mom? Will this person be like a committed follower of Jesus? Would they push me to grow in my relationship with Jesus? Don't date idly. Date with intention. Date with the end in mind. And why do we do that? It's because God created marriage and it's a unique and holy thing. And dating, if that's the case, then your dating should be unique and your dating should be holy. And maybe you're in here and you think that sounds impossible. Like you don't know how to date other than how everybody else dates. And you might think that all that stuff maybe is okay, but I just, I don't even think I can do it. Do you know that God's heart for you is, to, is for you to experience this overflow blessing in your life? And if that's the case, this is what God wants to do for you, and this is the opportunity to obey him, do you know that it can happen? God can do it. You can actually do this because of the Lord's power in your life. He's the one who's willing and able to help you. And I'm sure every married person in this room can look back on their dating years with some regrets about how they dated people. I know I have. And I, I think sometimes, man, if I could only go back and tell myself what I know now, man, the amount of hardship that I would have saved. How much heartache could have been avoided. And you either can date you can either do the work to date in light of God's plan, be different, but possibly made fun of, or and you could, with that line, experience the joy that comes from obeying and honoring God, or you can do it just the same way everybody's always done it in your friend group, in your school, in your workplace, and you can hit the same pitfalls that they all hit, and same pains and same hurts that they hit. You know, for the people in here who are like, man, I, I have hit these pitfalls. Like I, I am doing it now. Like all these, I'm not dating the way I need to date. Can I just like, the last thing I want you to hear is, is any condemnation from me. Be, because we know that God is able to heal every wounded heart. Maybe you've been hurt emotionally. God is able to heal you. Maybe you've messed up sexually. God can clean you. Maybe you've just like, you've blown it in some relationships. You've not been kind. You've not led with love. You've not honored the person that you're dating. There's always today. And God is always willing to be here to help you. But you gotta put in the work. You gotta do what you can do and try to obey God for him to do what only he can do. Only he is the one who can transform your relationships. Only he is the one who can bless you. And he wants to bless you more than you will ever know. And he has laid out the way for us to have a marriage that would honor him. And I just want to implore all of us today to do it the way God wants us to do it. And tonight, we're at the end of another message and you have the option of leaving here and just kind of be like, it's fine, it was long. It was okay, and forget about it. Or you have the option to actually ask God, be like, all right, God, what, what about this? 
would you have anything, would you, would you want to change anything about how I date? I give you permission. I just look, look around, let me know. Holy Spirit, like, just show me what it is that I need to change in my life, the areas I need to grow. And I promise you, if you sincerely ask that question, God will show you things. The Holy Spirit is an amazing counselor who is gentle, who can, who can bring things to your attention that God can take and he can heal. And you can start fresh today that will set you up for the rest of your life.